Oh, yeah, look, here you go. Now we know who said who. Yes. All right, guys, we're gonna go ahead and get things started here in just a moment. Right? I would love it.
Uh-huh. All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Nursing 502. Nice to see some of you guys. It looks like a lot of you I have your it. cameras off and are muted, and that's okay. No worries at all. We're going to start off today's session with a few announcements from Dr. Linda Myler. Dr. Linda Myler, are you there? I am, Dr. Shaler. Thanks for giving me a few minutes in the beginning of your class, and hello to everyone. Um, I just wanted to talk about Clinical Encounter 2. I posted the schedule online this afternoon, and I've also um, posted you know, some written instructions on that as well. Um, in terms of Clinical Encounter 2, it'll feel very much the same as Clinical Encounter 1, although the systems that we're talking about are musculoskeletal and neuro. So some changes since you've been to the Sim Center last. Um, they're under more COVID restrictions, so you will still enter through the ER like you did last time, be screened. But again, this time we're asking you to wear a mask and bring um, some face, uh, a face shield if you have them. If you don't have a face shield, they'll provide you one, but they're hoping that you could bring some sort of face protection with you. Um, how the schedule will go is it'll be very similar um, as last time where you'll enter in, you'll be put in a waiting area. We're asking that you come about 15 minutes ahead of your scheduled time. You'll be put in a waiting area and we've modified a few of the processes since we've gotten feedback from you and from some of the staff at the Sim Center. So we're gonna give you um, a five minute pre-brief or, or um, Heather um, Brooks will, the Sim coordinator. Following that pre-brief, you'll have five minutes to review the chart. So you'll have a designated time for five minutes to review the patient chart. And then you'll go into the encounter for 15 minutes. During the encounter, we'll have you wear your mask and your face shield and the patient will be wearing a mask and the patient is not allowed to um, take off their mask this time um, just due to the numbers of COVID that are out there. So they're just being extra cautious at the Sim Center. Um, they're not allowed to take off a mask. We're asking that you do a comprehensive history, which means that you are going to be asking the, que the patient questions related to their history that you see in the chart and get a comprehensive history and do a focused physical exam. So once you go over their history and their medications and if they're allergic to anything, then you're gonna go into your focused exam based upon their chief complaint. So that's the similar to last time, but we wanna make sure, last time we saw that people did kind of just a focused history one and we pared down the patient's history. So they're not gonna have this huge detailed history and you won't have enough time. We've pared down their history to give you a few little tidbits to ask them about, but making sure that you're getting all the information that you need to write your note. So following that 15 minutes, then you'll be going into another room and we're giving you more time to write your soap note. So we're giving you about 25 minutes to write your soap note this time. So that's a lot more time. Instead of 12 minutes, you're getting 25 minutes. You know what to expect. Um, and it, the template will be the same as last time where some of the information will be populated and some will not. So the soap notes and the revision and the feedback you got from last time should guide your um, should guide your soap note this time. So make sure that you're as complete as possible and that you, um, you give enough opportunity to write the narrative S part and the O part and look at the rubric ahead of time. I posted the template again um, and look at the rubric ahead of time. The only difference this time is that we aren't giving you, um, there's not time to give you a week to do revisions. So whatever you write this time, that's why we're giving you more time to do this soap note, whatever you write this time, um, is what is what will be um, what you'll be graded on. Um, I wanted to give you a couple of minutes, for, um, Dr. Schaller. Do I have a few minutes to open it up for questions? Yes, please. Okay. Does anybody have questions on kind of what to expect? Because I think the less um, there's less anxiety when you know what to expect, and you've done it once before, so it'll feel similar to that. But are there any questions on clinical encounter two? I have a question. Sure. Hi, um, I was just wondering in terms of like um, when we're doing the objective information, like if we want to know if the patient has like nystagmus or something, do we, how do we find that out? Because the volunteer might not particularly have it, but we just want like in that situation. You could ask the volunteer. So they're oh, if they have it. Yes, they're trying okay. to answer questions. And if you feel like it's something that you couldn't maybe assess, but you need the information, then you would just ask it and the volunteer will give it to you. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. 
Any other questions about clinical encounter two? Yeah, and more, more to answer that question. So if they did have nystagmus and you went to test ox, extra ocular movements, maybe that um, person doesn't have it, but for the clinical scenario picture, we're trying to portray that they do have it. They would tell you while you were doing that portion of the exam that there was nystagmus. And I think if you remember, those who did the respiratory last time, when we listened to lung sounds, then the patient said to those people, well, put your stethoscope over here and listen to these lung sounds. So they showed us how they assessed it, but then the findings were when they put their stethoscope on um, the little pad and it showed that they had wheezes. So um, that, they'll either tell you, um, we don't really have anything to kind of simulate that, but they'll tell you, but still do the exam. Any other questions on clinical encounter two or what to expect? It can, I'm sorry, this is, don't remember if I don't, Tina, I hope this doesn't sound too crazy, but um, last time I was just, I went in, I was just kind of standing and trying to write and take history. Is it appropriate to just like pull up the chair and talk to them for a minute to get their background? Is that okay? And then stand and do the, okay. It's actually you. what we want you to do. So we really would prefer if you, if you sat down with the patient. Um, you have 15 minutes. A lot of people got done really, really quick because um, I think they were nervous. So sit down, pull up a chair. Um, you can do the writing there. And then um, making sure we saw that a lot of people forgot to identify the patient. I know in the outpatient setting, we still want you to identify the patient. So being sure that you um, identify the patient, wash your hands, the same things as, as if it was a real clinical encounter. But great okay. question, team. Thank you. Other questions for Dr. Loomis or Dr. Schiller, anything else to add? Oh, you know what? I had a question. Sure. Um, so I know last time, I think they kind of changed it halfway through the way things were going with the last clinical encounter with like the later times. But um, do you still want us to give them a plan of care to the patient in the room? Um, we really don't want you to give them a plan of care. We really want you to, you're still coming up with your differential diagnoses and you can end the encounter. You can talk to them about that and you could say that I'm going to review the chart further um, and then I can give you a plan or these are some of the things I'm thinking about, but we really don't want you, you don't really know the plan of care at this point. We're asking you to come up with those differential diagnoses and then when you're writing your soap note, then you're gonna be doing your plan of care. Um, some students kind of went right to the plan of care um, I, you're not going to have time for that if you do the comprehensive history and the physical exam. Okay, thank you. Good question, Camille. Any other questions? Or My question, um, this is Liz McMahon, um, is about the systems. Now, these are going to be different systems, correct? Musculoskeletal and neuro. Those are the only two. Okay, perfect. All right. Yep. Thank you. All right, well, thanks for giving me this time, um, Dr. Schaller, and we will see you at Clinical Encounter 2. Thank you so much, Dr. Myler. We are going to continue on with our lecture today. Today, we're having an exciting topic. We are going to be talking about an introduction to radiology. We're going to go through some chest x-rays, some abdominal x-rays, and a lot of additional x-rays as well to give you guys some exposure uh, before clinical practice. And so that you have live faculty here to ask questions and to learn some material. So you guys all know me. My name is Frank Schaller. I'm a family nurse practitioner. The vast majority of my experience is in the emergency department and in the urgent care settings. And I was so lucky to have my esteemed colleague, Brandy Jones, to co-present with me. We are going to be having some conversations back and forth, bouncing ideas off of each other. And I wanted to give Brandy a moment to introduce herself as well. Brandy? Good afternoon, students. As Dr. Schaller said, my name's Brandy Jones. I, like you, went through this uh, Master of Nursing program, and I'm looking forward to sharing any and all knowledge that I have with you guys about x-rays. It's a great honor to be here with you, Dr. Schaller. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Brandy. I appreciate you being here, taking time out of your very busy schedule. 
So something that we are going to be using throughout this lecture today is a type of technology, and it's a way for me to pull you guys along the way to ask questions. And if you guys wouldn't mind just taking a moment and navigating to this website on your mobile phone, your tablet, whatever device you have, maybe you'll open another browser window on your laptop. And it is simply pollev.com slash Frank S. 444. I'll give you guys a moment to do that. It's going to ask for your first name if you wouldn't be so kind to just type in your first name when it prompts you. And we'll start off with a practice poll question just to see how it's working, if you guys are able to get it going. So how are you feeling today? Choose the smiley face or frowny face or maso meno so so face. Uh-oh, I see an orange person. I see lots of green. It looks like you guys are getting the hang of it. So that's wonderful. I myself, I'm feeling fantastic. I'm that bright green guy all the way on the right. Let's do some more questions while I have you guys here. So true or false question for you guys, thinking about chest x-rays, thinking about pneumonia. So pneumonia is always detectable on chest x-ray. What do you guys think, true or false? And it looks like everybody is choosing false. Great job. Pneumonia is not always detected on chest x-ray. Sometimes the patient may be dehydrated or it is a pneumonia that's just simply not picked up on your basic radiograph and would need CT or computed tomography imaging in order to pick that up. How about another true or false question? Broken bones are always detectable on x-ray. True or false? Very easy question so far, and you guys are crushing them. That is false. How about this one? An abdominal x-ray should always be ordered for abdominal pain. Randy, what do you think? Should an abdominal x-ray always be ordered for abdominal pain? Dr. Schaller, on that one, I would have to say that is false. Can you give me an example of where uh, a patient has abdominal pain and you wouldn't necessarily order an abdominal x-ray? Well, a huge part of your examination for your patient is going to be your clinical skill. The x-ray is going to be helpful in certain cases. However, if your patient presents with uh, symptoms of, say, an acute appendicitis, there are going to be things that you know as a nurse and even more so as an advanced nurse practitioner that is going to automatically warrant you, uh, if not in an ER setting or hospital setting, to send this person to the hospital. And that will not always be shown on x-ray. There are many things in the abdomen that you just simply can't see with an x-ray. Wonderful. I agree wholeheartedly. Thank you for that expertise, Brandy. Another question for you guys. A chest x-ray won't miss lung cancer. True or false? True. False.
and all of the respondents are correct false. It will unfortunately miss some lung cancers where more advanced imaging would be needed, such as a low dose CT of the chest. How about this one? X-ray was discovered on November 8th, 1895 in Germany. Sound, sound plausible, maybe? I wonder if anybody is fast typing Google asking this question or if it's just not that serious. <laughs> the answer here is true. It was discovered on November 8, 1895 in Germany. Now you have some dinner talk for later on today when you're sitting around. How about this one? A kidney stone can be discovered by x-ray. True or false? Come on. Oh Y'all done? Huh? Um. Uh oh. Pick it up. Okay. You pooped? Uh -uh. No? All right, guys. It looks like we are split here on the responses. So the correct answer here is true. A kidney stone can be discovered by x-ray. They won't all show up on x-ray, but later on in the lecture here, I will show you guys some examples of kidney stones that were picked up on a kidney, ureter, bladder, abdominal x-ray. So jumping into the objectives for our lecture today. So we are going to talk about understanding the essentials for interpreting x-rays, we will identify purposes for performing x-rays, identify anatomical structures on chest and abdominal x-rays and other x-rays, develop a systematic method to analyze and interpret x-rays, especially chest x-rays, recognize abnormal and normal radiological findings, and then discuss the role of the advanced practice registered nurse in ordering and interpreting chest x-rays. So here is a visual example of a chest x-ray and this chest x-ray is a PA chest x-ray. PA stands for posterior anterior. So if you look at the x-ray waves, they enter the patient's posterior chest and they exit the anterior chest, hence the name PA. There are some differences between PA and AP chest x-rays. So typically a standard chest x-ray, it's gonna be a PA and lateral view. You'll see here this image on the right, that is an AP chest x-ray. So not your standard chest x-ray. It looks like the heart is coming out larger. It's also looking like the lungs are a little bit under inflated. So just some things to keep in mind. This, these images are showing differences in how chest x-rays might turn out depending on if your patient is in full inspiration or expiration. So the image on the left, we can see the lung fields quite well. The image on the right, not so much. There looks like there's a decent amount of patchiness and haziness. All right, another x-ray. So just looking at the differences between a male and a female. So the female has different anatomy, female has breasts. So oftentimes we will see the breast tissue on the chest x-ray, which can sometimes obscure our findings, uh, but just something to be cognizant of. And there's other considerations when thinking about interpretation of chest x-rays as well. So what are you looking for? What are the correct images to order? What are you going to do with the findings, whether they're abnormal or normal? Do you have any previous imaging on the patient, whether it's in their chart or perhaps getting into touch with one of their providers? Is this the best test to use in the circumstance? For example, if you think your patient has a pulmonary embolism, are you going to order a chest x-ray to look for that? I, I don't think you'll see a pulmonary embolism on an x-ray. And is it worth the risk thinking about is the patient pregnant? And uh, do they have any other risk factors for too much radiation exposure? So this image is a chart just showing the type of radiology study, 
And the middle column there shows the dose of radiation and millirads. So if you're looking at your standard chest X-ray, it's less than one millirad, very low radiation exposure. And this could be compared to what each and every one of us is exposed to just on a daily basis for 10 days. After 10 days, we are exposed to as much radiation as just your basic chest X-ray. All right, guys, question time. What is an indication for a chest X-ray? Go ahead and type that out. While your students are um, typing, Dr. Schaller, I just want them to also keep in mind that it is your responsibility as the um, provider to be sure to make sure that a female is not pregnant. So be sure to do your um, pregnancy testing with that uh, patient that is female before you x-ray them. Typically, you can do that with a very quick urine sample. That is a wonderful point, Brandy. If your patient is female and they are of childbearing age, why not just get that urine preg real quick just to make sure you cover all your bases? Getting lots of good response from you guys. Lots of cough, shortness of breath, any lung related symptoms, pneumonia you're worried about. These are great responses. Hemoptysis, coughing up blood. So those were great responses, guys. So indications from my end, any chest pain or shortness of breath, you have a concern for infection, uh, perhaps trauma, metastatic disease, biopsy localization, inhaled foreign bodies, and maybe tube or line placement. I would also definitely add to that. I think your students, very sharp students, they did, uh, a lot of them said cough too. I think a patient with, you know, a cough that has been presenting for quite some time, maybe anything over, um, maybe even two weeks that is productive. Um, think about that history with that patient, uh, if they're a smoker and things of that nature. Yeah, that's a great point, Brandy. And uh, another thing that I would add to that is I, I wouldn't necessarily get a chest x-ray on every single patient that comes into the clinic with a cough. Because if I did that, I might be getting chest x-rays on patients who have seasonal allergies, maybe just your standard viral syndrome. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily get a chest x-ray on every cough. However, I would get a chest x-ray if there was cough in conjunction with maybe adventitious lung sounds, such as crackles or diminished lung sounds, uh, perhaps the patient's SpO2 is, I don't know, somewhere between 90 and 94 or lower. Um, those are circumstances where I am concerned about a potential underlying pathology like a pneumonia or potentially something even more dangerous. So this is an example of a normal chest. It's very important to familiarize yourself with what a normal chest x-ray looks like. And there's quite a bit of anatomy to see here. So looking at this normal chest x-ray, I can see the spinal processes up towards the top. There is the beautiful airway, the trachea. It appears midline. We see the anterior and posterior ribs, clavicles, scapulae, the aortic knob. What else do we see? Bronchial bifurcation. We see the hilar bilaterally, the descending aorta, the right atrium, the diaphragm, the liver, and the gastric air bubble. We will talk more about these individually as we go along. Some of those terms might sound like foreign language right now, and that's okay. We will jump into those a little bit further in the near future, I promise. On the lateral chest x-ray, See a lot of anatomy here as well, a lot of overlapping between the other view as well. But on this lateral view, you'll note, you can see both the left and the right diaphragm. And there are a decent amount of cases of pneumonia that can be picked up just simply by seeing that there was obscuring of the right or left diaphragm. So just something to keep in mind. 
thinking about the procedure for interpretation. So we're gonna want to learn and think about how to be consistent and systematic in our approach when evaluating x-rays. So first things first, super basic stuff. We're gonna wanna get the patient's name, their age and their sex. Think about the orientation, what side landmarks are on, if there's any type of rotation when the image was taken. And then the quality as well. Is there good exposure? Is the focus okay as well? You'll see a lot of skeletal structures when looking at a chest X-ray. So we have the scapula, the humerus and shoulders, the clavicles, the ribs, the spine, a decent amount of soft tissue. Again, the diaphragm and the costophrenic angles. And then if the patient has any tubes, lines, things of that nature, maybe they're hospitalized, we'll see those things as well. Thinking about the lungs, when we're looking to see was there adequate inspiration when the exam was taken, you'll wanna count the ribs to see if it was adequate. You'll compare the left lung to the right lung. You'll of course observe the airway and the trachea, major bronchi as well, and see if you can identify the fissures and the lobes. So the right lung has, by a show of hands, how many lungs or how many lobes, the right lung, by a show of fingers, one, two, there are three, I see lots of threes, good job. And then the left chest, how many lobes of the lung? I'm seeing lots of twos, good. And it's only two lobes because we have the heart that takes up a lot of space on the left chest there. So this image is literally a snapshot of one of my boards questions. I had one boards question that had an image and this was the only image that was on my entire board exam. And it asked me to interpret this chest X-ray. So I'm wondering if you guys are noticing any obvious abnormalities when you first look at this chest X-ray. Go ahead and type in the chat if you are noticing something unusual. Looks like Tina thinks some opacity in the right lobe. Which lobe would you say, Tina? Give me one second. I, um, I would go with either middle or lower. Lower? Yep, that's correct. So there is uh, a pretty obvious opacity in the right lower lobe there. And that was, again, my only boards question that had an image with it. So I had to share that with you guys. So if you can right out the gate, notice that there's an abnormality there, that's kind of how basic that board's question was for me, for me. And oftentimes when I am working clinically in the urgent care, when I walk up to a chest X-ray and I look at it, I'm looking for that obvious opacity if I'm looking for a type of pneumonia. Will we sometimes have very subtle pneumonias that aren't showing up like when I first evaluate it and the radiologist sees it later? Yes, that does happen, but I'm not perfect. The radiologist has more training and experience than myself and all of us. And we will occasionally miss a subtle pneumonia and that's okay, but we're gonna wanna put the whole clinical picture together. Is that patient presenting with your typical pneumonia type features? So with that, Dr. Schaller, um, in your experience, I know that I've seen cough, I've seen fever. What else would you tell your students to kind of clinically correlate with uh, maybe a, a little less subtle uh, indicator of pneumonia on x-ray? That's a great question, Brandy. So I would pay really good attention to the heart borders. If there's any obscuring of the right or left heart border, there could be a sign of like a subtle lingular pneumonia, perhaps on the left. I would also pay extra attention to the costophrenic angles, which let me see if I can draw here for you guys. This is the costophrenic angle. See how clear and neat that looks? It looks fantastic. And then if I come over to the other side of the lung here, I'm not seeing a very clear angle down in this area here. There's quite a bit of opacity there. So that's another spot that I would keep an eye out for a potential hiding pneumonia.
So a little bit more anatomy that we can see on a right lateral chest X-ray. We see the right upper lobe, the right middle lobe, and the right lower lobe. Again, this is just a normal X-ray right lateral view. The left lateral view, we have our left upper lobe, the left lower lobe, and a little bit of the lingula as well. And in a patient who has COPD or is barrel chested, there's a good chance we'll see um, some additional airspace in that anterior chest there or that lingula area. All right, let's talk about a systematic approach to assessing your patient's chest x-rays. I have a really simple mnemonic for you guys to memorize and follow. It's so simple that even my three-year-old knows it. It's A, B, C, D, E, first five letters of the alphabet, all right? So A is for airway, B is for bones and breathing, C is for cardiac silhouette, D is for diaphragm, and E is for everything else. And we're gonna go through each one of these individually so that you guys know what to look out for when you're evaluating a chest X-ray. So again, Normal chest, super important to familiarize yourself with what a normal chest looks like. Now let's jump through each of those letters in our A, B, C, D, E mnemonic. A is for airway. It's kind of important, right? So the airway, initially, we're gonna be want to evaluate the trachea. And you're gonna ask yourself, is it midline? Perhaps there is a pathology that is causing some tracheal deviation. So a pathology that might push the trachea uh, push it away could include a large pleural effusion or a tension pneumothorax. A pathology that pulls the trachea could include a consolidation with a lobar collapse. So I'm curious if you guys are evaluating the trachea on this image here and you're just evaluating the chest x-ray at large, type in the chat, what do you think's going on here? Think about the trachea, think about the overall chest x-ray. I think if I can help your students out here, I would look at that trachea and try to figure out why it's deviating more so to the right. But I think with that big circle you've got there is a big clue. For sure, Brandy, I would agree 100%. And it looks like Sarah is chiming in and saying there's some pushing of the trachea and I agree with both of you guys wholeheartedly. There is some right tracheal deviation. It's pretty subtle in this image, but look at that large pleural effusion in that left lower lobe. You can't miss that. There's like almost complete white out of that left lung there. So again, this is pleural effusion with tracheal deviation to the right. More about the airway. So what if we wanted to evaluate our patient for a foreign body? What if we had clinical concern that there was inhalation of a foreign body after getting that history and doing the physical exam? So thinking a little bit more about that, if you guys wouldn't mind, type in the chat, what would be a clinical manifestation of a foreign body in the airway? If you walked in, you assessed your patient, and you, you were thinking there was a foreign body in the airway, what are some clinical manifestations you might see? And that, Dr. Schaller, is that a, looks like a child there. I would agree that chest looks pretty small. The ribs are really close together. Uh, it's probably maybe a three, four, five-year-old child. And boy, we know they put things in their mouths all the time. Yes, they sure do. They are so curious. <laughs> so getting lots of responses in the chat here. So a couple of people are saying strider, abnormal breathing, no air movement, maybe oxygen desaturations, choking, shortness of breath. I would have to agree with pretty much every single one of those. Uh, we might see some mild tachypnea. Choking is a big one, perhaps some wheezing. Um, maybe some chest discomfort. The, the image that you guys see in front of you, this is a, a four-year-old child who swallowed a nickel, a coin. 
Um, so I would imagine if, if I were to pick up a quarter right now and swallow it, it, it would hurt, right? You'd have a lot of discomfort and dyspnea. So one thing to be cognizant of is that some foreign bodies, they're not going to be able to be seen on a chest x-ray. So for example, I remember I had a patient in clinical practice one time. She was brought in by EMS. She was brought in from the nursing home because she was choking and she had a low pulse ox. Nobody could figure out what's going on. They just saw grandma was, you know, a little short of breath. She was choking and her oxygen was in the 80s. So on initial assessment of the patient, I am evaluating the posterior pharynx, asking them to open their mouth, checking out that airway, right? ABCs, airway. And what did I see in grandma's mouth and her posterior pharynx? She had a massive chunk of unchewed chicken just chilling in her posterior pharynx. And it was obvious that that was causing an airway issue. There was foreign body. So I simply asked the staff to grab me a pair of forceps, grab that piece of unchewed chicken, pulled it out. And what do you, what do you guess? Magic, the patient improved. That airway was not occluded anymore. So what I'm trying to get at here is if I were to take a picture of that grandma, I don't think I'd see the piece of chicken in the airway, okay? So there are some things that aren't gonna show up on the x-ray. More about the airway. So we have the carina and the bronchi as well. And the right main bronchus is generally wider and shorter and a little bit more vertic vertical than the left main bronchus. And as a result of this, it's more common for an inhaled foreign object to become lodged in that area. That route is a little bit more direct. Then we have our hilar structures. So the hilar, they consist of the main pulmonary vasculature and the major bronchi as well. And I just wanna outline where the hilar are on this picture for you guys. Try this one more time. Let's see. All right, here we go. So we have hilar in this area, hilar in this area, and you'll see it sort of extends down bilaterally. And this is normal on a chest X-ray. Some Somebody might argue and say, why is there a little bit of whiting out of the chest X-ray there? Is that a pneumonia there? I would have to argue and say, no, I know that the hilar are present bilaterally there. And each of the hilar, they have a collection of lymph nodes, which typically aren't visible in a healthy individual. And they're typically about even in size bilaterally. So if you're noticing any asymmetry between the hilar, then that should raise suspicion of a potential pathology. So for example, if there's bilateral symmetrical enlargement, of the hilar, this is typically associated with the disease process sarcoidosis, or if you're noticing unilateral or asymmetrical enlargement of the hilar, this could be due to an underlying malignancy. So just some things to be on the lookout for. All right, we talked about A, let's jump into B, bones and breathing. So check out these images on the left and the right. The image on the left has a red arrow pointing to something that might be abnormal. And then there is an image on the right that has a circle on the right lung. Do me a favor, type in the chat what you think might be going on here when looking at these zones and lobes.
All right, so I have a couple responses so far, looking at the zones, the lobes of the lungs. Um, Swad says possible fracture, maybe, but I, I'm more so paying attention to the, the lobes and the zones of the lungs. I know the image isn't perfectly clear, so it can be sort of difficult, but this image on the left with uh, somewhat of an opacity in that left middle lobe area, that is a, a mass or a cancer. And it, they're not all gonna show up on your standard chest X-ray, but this one is a little bit more advanced, so we are able to see it. And our image on the right is a, a pneumonia in that right middle, right lower lobe. And it's, it's pretty obvious, it's pretty white. That's an obvious right middle lobe, right lower lobe opacity. So here, just giving you guys a couple chest X-ray examples of different pathologies that you might see on your chest X-ray. You're going to want to assess the pleura as well. And the pleura typically are not normally visible in your healthy adult patient unless there's an abnormality such as pleural thickening. So this image on the left shows a pneumothorax on the left-hand side. And on the right, our image is showing a patient who has the clinical scenario of mesothelioma. So again, a couple clinical examples of abnormalities that you might pick up on your chest x-ray. So B is breathing and bones. There's a ton of bones we can see on our chest x-ray. You are going to want to be sure to assess the bones for any sign of fracture or any type of like lytic lesion in the bone. So what are your guys thoughts on this image on the left here? There's a big red circle pointing something out. I'll give you the history. So the patient was walking around, tripped on a, a child's toy, fell on the left hand side and had some pain on the left chest. The patient takes Eliquis, vitamin D and calcium simply coming in complaining of left side pain. Vital signs are stable. When you assess your patient, you're noticing there's some pretty obvious bruising noted to the left chest. Do you guys see anything unusual on that chest X-ray on the left? Can I give them a clue, Dr. Schaller? Yeah, definitely. On this image to the left, guys, I'd say think more so about bony structure. Don't forget x-rays, um, they're really good with, with showing bones uh, for things. They do pick up other things like Dr. Schaller is saying, but I'd focus in and hone in on the, the bone content on this picture. So Eva, thank you for chiming in. Fracture, Tina, rib fractures on the left. Kristen, Christina, everybody's saying fractured ribs. Tina sees perhaps a hemothorax. So on this image, I am seeing multiple contiguous rib fractures on the left-hand side. So this patient is going to end up requiring admission to the hospital if they're not already there uh, because of the multiple contiguous uh, rib fractures. In this case, the patient will need continuous hemodynamic monitoring um, and, uh, you know, assessment for further intervention. If this was just your single rib fracture on one side, really not a big deal. It's going to heal up on its own. The patient wouldn't necessarily require hospitalization. It's more so pain control, trying to prevent a pneumonia from uh, and encouraging deep breathing, incentive spirometer, things of that nature, and then pain control as well. A fractured rib is incredibly painful. How about this image on the right of the chest x-ray? Thinking again about B, bones, is there anything unusual that is sticking out on this image? And I'll give you the clinical history. So it's a 70-year-old male, has been drinking and smoking heavily since they were a teenager, and occupation as a retired painter. This patient's coming in complaining of pain in both of their arms for several weeks. So I don't know about you guys, but this patient sounds like they have a, a lot of risk factors for cancer. What do you guys see on that chest X-ray?
And we're getting several responses from you guys. Thank you. Tina sees a lytic lesion. Kristen, left humerus mass. Kendall, humerus lesion. And Christina, right arm deformity of bone, perhaps arthritis. So I would agree with you guys. Check out those lytic lesions bilaterally on the proximal humerus. That looks grossly abnormal to me. And there's some other abnormalities noted in the left lower lobe here as well perhaps some other lytic lesions. And just given that clinical history, all of those risk factors for cancers, I am not surprised that we are seeing this on a chest x-ray. That, that is a grossly abnormal chest x-ray. Jumping into C, cardiac. So we're gonna wanna assess the heart size, right? And a healthy individually, the heart should occupy no more than 50% of the thoracic width. So the cardiothoracic ratio will be less than 0.5. And this rule is only going to be applying to a PA view of a chest x-ray. So if a heart is occupying more than 50% of the thoracic width, and again, on a PA chest x-ray, then this can suggest abnormal enlargement, also known as cardiomegaly. So cardiomegaly can occur for a wide variety of reasons. And some of these might include valvular disease, cardiomyopathy, pulmonary hypertension, or perhaps pericardial effusion as well. We see this oftentimes in our heart patients. And I do so, think on, on most x-ray machines there, if you don't know how to measure, don't worry because most x-ray machines will give you a tool that will help you be able to measure. You're not expected to per se know 50% just by looking at it. Although over the years, you'll begin to see it. Yes, thank you for pointing that out, Brandy. So if you have the chest x-ray pulled up yourself on PAX or whatever imaging technology you're using, they will give you a ruler that you can use to look for that. Is it greater than 50%? So check out this chest x-ray, guys. There's, I mean, that's a huge heart right out the gate. I can see there's some obvious cardiomegaly there, but are you guys seeing any other structures, abnormalities, anything else going on in that chest x-ray? Type it in the chat if you notice it. I cannot get over the size of that heart. It's massive. That is a pretty big heart. <laughs> All right, so we're getting some responses from everybody. Thank you. Um, Tina says, maybe a density in the left lower breast. Kendall says, circular structures mid chest. Kind of looks like a marshmallow or something there. What is that thing? Uh, something on the aorta, a clip or a metal ring, says Kristen. Um, implants, says Camille. So what I see on this chest X-ray, uh, right in the mid chest there along the mediastinum, that is actually an old mitral valve repair. So what you guys see there is a, uh, a mitral valve. Good pickup, guys. You guys, are, you guys are already getting so good at chest X-ray interpretation. Thinking about assessing the heart borders. So we have our right heart structures and our left heart structures. And the heart borders may become difficult to distinguish from the lung fields as a result of different pathologies. So maybe consolidation. And this can cause an increased opacity of the lung tissue, like pneumonia. So if we ever notice any loss of definition of the right heart border, that's probably going to end up being associated with a right middle lobe consolidation. And if we have loss of definition of the left heart border, then perhaps there is some type of lingular consolidation or pneumonia going on there. That's a Check good out. Yeah, check out this chest x-ray here. I'm wondering what your guys' thoughts are. Type your ideas in the chat. What's your interpretation of this chest x-ray? Again, we just got done talking about the borders of the heart.
the loss of that heart border is a big clue that I think um, in, when I was in school, I always tried to think about what that means because it's pretty common. So it sounds like you're paying special attention to the right and left heart border anytime you're evaluating your chest x-ray on your patient. Yeah. Side note, I can see a lot of you guys with your cameras on. You guys look so good and so healthy. It's awesome to see you guys. All right, so Tina, maybe a bilateral lower lobe pneumonia. Christina, pericardial effusion. So when I am assessing the left border of the heart here, I don't know about you guys, but I do not see a distinct border of that left side of the heart there. So if I'm putting this in conjunction with the clinical history, maybe this patient has cough, fever, shortness of breath, exposure to COVID-19, here we see a left upper lobe slash lingular infiltrate. And there's, again, there's pretty obvious loss of that left heart border. Let's jump to D. D is for diaphragm. So the right hemidiaphragm in most cases is going to be a little bit higher in healthy individuals as compared to the left. And this is due to some of the underlying anatomy, aka the liver. And on the left, the stomach underlies the left hemidiaphragm, and it's best identified just by locating the gastric bubble on the left. And this chest x-ray is unfortunately demonstrating a surgical emergency. I don't know if you guys picked that out, but I'm going to talk to you guys about it. So this chest x-ray, where that little black arrow is, is showing a pneumoperitoneum in more layman's terms, free air in the abdomen. And again, this is a surgical emergency due to the likely acute intra-abdominal process. So on exam with this patient, you'll probably see signs of peritonitis. So 10 out of 10 abdominal pain. Their abdomen is hard, rigid, board-like. This patient's probably gonna appear acutely ill. Maybe they're tachycardic, hypotensive, things of that nature. Is everybody seeing that pneumoperitoneum there on the right hemi hemidiaphragm? It almost looks like it almost looks like a little sunset of dark space or air. Mm -hmm. You guys see that there? It's subtle, but that that's an emergency. We have to pick that up every time. Dr. Schaller, if I could add, clinically um, with this type of patient, they would typically demonstrate an extreme amount of pain. So you would be categorizing that person likely as a 10 out of 10 pain. Um, they would have a really rigid, tight abdomen and they would honestly look acutely ill. Um, with that type of presentation, if you're not in a hospital setting, you would be getting them immediately to get help in the hospital without what causes a doubt. That? so somebody chimed in and said what causes that so an, an acute intra-abdominal process could cause that so maybe the patient had a complicated diverticulitis that developed an abscess and it ruptured and there was a bunch of air accumulating uh, perhaps uh, an appendicitis a ruptured appendicitis could also cause pneumoperitoneum so these are again these are surgical emergencies and they are, it's typically caused by an acute intra-abdominal process. All right, assessing the costophrenic angles right after assessing that diaphragm. So again, the, the costophrenic angles, they should be pretty clear, pretty discreet. Uh, and the right lung on this image, I can see the costophrenic angle. It's very clear. It's very discreet. It's easy to see. And we'll notice this, these healthy costophrenic angles bilaterally on a normal chest x-ray on a normal healthy adult patient. So any loss of this acute angle, it is referred to as costophrenic blunting. And this can suggest the presence of fluid or consolidation, maybe a pneumonia in the area. And other etiologies that could cause costophrenic blunting, perhaps lung, and, lung hyperinflation, like seen in your COPD patients, and um, 
what do you guys think about this chest x-ray that you see on the screen here? Do you guys see the costophrenic angle clearly on both sides or do you see some costophrenic blunting? No, blunting on the left. Blunt, yeah. blunt, blunt, blunting for sure on the left. I agree 100%. <clears throat> So this is costophrenic blunting due to pneumonia on the left. Great job. And then we made it to E guys. E stands for everything else. And I'm not gonna spend a ton of time talking about all of these because I know you guys are primary care nurse practitioner students, but I'll at least touch on some of them just for your general knowledge, okay? So here is an example of an endotracheal tube Typically, this is found three to five centimeters from the carina, and the carina is located anywhere between T5 and T7. Here's an example of a central line that you guys can see in this image. Here's a chest tube on the right lung, and for a pleural effusion, typically these are inserted posterior to inferior, and in a pneumothorax, they are inserted anterior to superior. Here's a pacemaker. I was going through the lecture earlier today and my six-year-old walked up behind me and he's like, daddy, what is that? That, that looks weird. That looks strange. That's not normal. What is that, dad? That's just a pacemaker. Implanted in the left chest wall there. And I can see it has three leads and those three leads are going to be attached to the right atrium, the right ventricle, and the left coronary sinus. How about an NG tube? Anybody have experience inserting NG tubes? Raise your hand. Seeing some hands go up. Nurses generally do not like doing this procedure, but I guarantee you the patient doesn't like it even more. But Looking at these images on the left, this looks like a beautifully inserted NG tube, probably inserted by one of you guys because you guys are so darn intelligent. So it's following a straight course down the midline of the chest to a point clearly below the diaphragm there on the left. The tube never follows the path of a bronchus. There's no obvious coiling of the tube anywhere. And the tip of the tube is below the diaphragm and you can see it pretty clearly there in the gastric bubble. But holy smokes, what happened to that NG tube on the right? That you guys looked... see that? What happened there? Went to the right bronchus. It sure did. So I, I wonder if it went to that right bronchus, how is that patient going to be acting clinically? Dysnic, O2 desatting, choking, coughing. 100%. I agree 100%. So in that situation, we're going to want to intervene and gently remove that NG tube. That is not very good placement. All right, guys, I would like to give everybody a five to 10 minute break here. Get up, stretch, use the restroom, grab some coffee, do whatever you got to do. I want to make sure that we all reduce our risk for pressure ulcers and DVTs. I will see you guys back at 4.40 p.m. Thank you. You're welcome.
<clears throat> All right, guys, it's 440. We're going to jump back into it here. Can I get a thumbs up if you can hear me? I hear you. All right. I got, I got a thumbs up. I got lots of thumbs up. Cool. Thanks, guys. So I hit the jackpot when I went upstairs for a quick break. My wife brought home some Tim Hortons donuts. Man, oh man, did that hit the spot. All right. <laughs> Let's jump back into talking about some clinical examples of other x-rays. So thinking about congestive heart failure. So some suggestive findings that you might see on a chest x-ray, maybe cardiomegaly. Uh, perhaps pleural effusions, maybe curly B lines. And you're going to want to put your clinical features into account as well. And Brandy, if you think about a patient that you've had in clinical practice where you were suspicious of CHF, what kind of clinical features did you see? Clinically, uh, I can think of one particular patient that stood out, a uh, 45-year-old obese uh, male um, who had a ton of swelling and edema, uh, bilaterally, both feet, both legs, he had putting edema way plus three, even went up to his, his thighs and to his scrotum. Um, oh. he was tachycardic, his D dimer was elevated. Um, and the x-ray showed a lot of interesting things that you guys are going to see. You know, when, when you mentioned that you, that this patient had some scrotal edema, I've seen so many times in, not, maybe not so many times, but a few times in clinical practice where a patient was in fulminant congestive heart failure, and they had a scrotum the size of a, I kid you not, a bowling ball, just unbelievable edema, you know, something that you could never forget if you saw clinically. So here is an image of a chest x-ray where we are starting to see some congestive heart failure. It's pretty obvious congestive heart failure. Uh, number one, there is some cardiomegaly there. There are curly B lines as well, which if you're not sure what curly B lines are, they are horizontal lines that you can see within the chest x-ray. I'm going to see if I can't draw it out for you guys as an example. So there's a curly B line, curly B, curly B. So I'm seeing them all over the place bilaterally. Those are what curly B lines look like on a chest X-ray. And that should key you into perhaps there's some pretty decent CHF going on here. And I'll never forget, um, actually backsplash a little bit. So there was a joke that I saw one time on a blog and it was talking about how a radiologist was looking at a chest X-ray they were evaluating for CHF and basically patient came in, they were septic, they were 54 years old, admitted to the ICU. Uh, the guy was intubated. He received aggressive diuresis to try to get rid of his excess edema. And when the radiologist appropriately noted those persistent curly B lines, meaning patient probably needed more or increased diuresis, he read this out loud to his dictation software and didn't pay super crucial attention to detail. And the following quote is what came out in his dictation. So he said, interval increase in pulmonary interstitial infiltrates with persistent bilateral effusions emphasized by prominent Cardi B lines, <laughs> not curly B lines, Cardi B. You guys know Cardi B? <laughs> Suggestive of worsening fluid overload. So maybe an instance for you guys to remember those curly B lines, how they relate to CHF, Cardi B lines, curly B lines. <laughs> 
So here is another patient I had in clinic. And this patient came in, they were complaining of chest pain. Uh, I didn't do a phenomenal job with the history taking, but I got a chest x-ray and this is what I saw. And it's not the clearest image, my apologies. But when you look at this chest x-ray, I don't know about you guys, but it's it appears grossly abnormal. There is some type of like pleural thickening going on on the left-hand side there. Almost looks like, I don't know, like an angel wing or something. It just looks completely abnormal. So I went back, I got a better history on the patient. And sure enough, they said, yeah, I had, I had tuberculosis back in the day. I have old TB. Uh, you don't have to worry about that on my chest X-ray. And I compared it to some previous images. And sure enough, the patient was right. Uh, it, it was an old prior TB infection. So nothing that I had to be too worried about. All right. So we talked a lot about pneumonia. I'm not going to go back through this slide, but I do want to ask you guys a question. What are the clinical features of pneumonia on your patient? What are some things that you might see? We talk a lot about pneumonia, but it, I mean, it kills the elderly. It kills people. It puts people in ICUs and hospitals. It's, it's important. And common one I'd say we see often too in clinic. This one's turning out kind of cool. I like this. It's like building a little word collage. Would you add chest pain? Uh, oh, there you go, chest pain. Yeah, there. chest pain, maybe back pain. Mm -hmm. This is awesome. Tachypnea, crackles. Abdominal pain from pleuritis are um, yeah, of uh, pulmonary process too. I would agree. Awesome job, guys. So another quick question for you. What might you find on exam for a patient with pneumonia? So think about your advanced assessment skills that you've learned so far in this course. Crackles, a BSN, RN will find that. What will an APRN find? What about central cyanosis? That is scary. <laughs> <laughs> so some cyanosis around the nose, the mouth. All right, dullness to percussion. Nice, that's what I'm talking about. WBCs elevated. What about on your physical exam, guys? We got dullness on percussion. You guys remember that word tactile frematis? Or the good old plural fr friction rub. Plural friction rub. What about egophony? Oh yeah, someone typed it, egophony, nice. So. What uh, what would what would that sound like? Egophony. Um, e would sound like a. E would sound like a. E is the best because E starts E M U and A is abnormal, right? It's A stands for abnormal. Muffled sounds, triple A, awesome. You guys are so darn intelligent. All right, so here is a chest X-ray, again, just showing an example of a right lower lobe pneumonia. There's loss of the right heart border again, and there's opacity noted there. What do you guys think's going on with this chest X-ray? Think about the heart borders. Think about your lung fields and zones. How's it looking? Mm 
Um, looks like definitely some wires going on and yeah i and see i I see some E for everything else, wires. There's definitely some wires. Mm -hmm. This patient looks like they're probably hospitalized. Yeah. How do the lungs look though? Diffuse opacities, maybe a little, I don't see the heart borders really well. You hit the nail right on the head. So guys, this is an example of a COVID-19 pneumonia. The most mm -hmm. common pneumonia seen in COVID-19 is a multi-lobar pneumonia. You're gonna see at least pneumonia bilaterally at the bases, and perhaps you're gonna see it all over the place. So on this chest X-ray, I'm seeing multi-lobar pneumonia. Great job, Tina. I think they're calling those uh, glass-like opacities. Uh, yes, yep. ground glass opacities, yep. All right, how about our COPD patient? What are some suggestive features we might see on that chest X-ray? I sort of touched on it earlier. All right, atelectasis. Perhaps some atelectasis. Overinflated, yeah, overinflated um, lungs, uh, maybe a large hemidiaphragm. Yes, hyperinflated lungs, I would agree. Uh, the diaphragm, maybe a flattened diaphragm Flatten. because of those hyperinflated lungs. Perhaps an increased AP diameter. And the heart and mediastinum, a lot of times they look very thin. And I'm going to show you guys an example of a COPD x-ray. So this guy came in, 70 years old, smokes like a chimney. He's always coughing, spitting up sputum every single day. And looking at this chest x-ray, I don't know about you guys, but I'm seeing obvious lung hyperinflation. Again, that heart and that mediastinum look pretty thin and has the typical COPD clinical features. May I ask a, a question? Yes, Are we allowed please. to ask a question? Okay. Yeah, please. On that, so like when I'm looking at that and the, the lungs look long to me compared to somebody else. So is that the, I mean, they just look longer. I don't know yes. how to explain it. So they look longer for two reasons. Number one, the hyperinflation of the lungs. So they, I mean, they aren't just like this. They are ballooned out completely bilaterally. So it's pushing, it's pushing down on that diaphragm on both sides. And then the mediastinum looks thinner than your normal chest x-ray patient. So both of those findings put together makes the lungs look like they're just like long and skinny. Yeah, they do. Wow. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. All right. And a pneumothorax. So some suggestive findings on a pneumothorax. There's going to be a marked difference in transparency from the affected to non-affected lung fields. You won't see vascular markings on the affected side. And you'll be able to identify the pleural margin most of the time. Probably going to see some tracheal deviation. And they're going to have the clinical features of a pneumothorax. What are some clinical features of a pneumothorax? You can type it in the chat. Hopefully we don't see too many of those in our primary care clinical practice, but you're, you're likely to run into at least one. Nice, we're getting some nice responses. Dyspnea, pleuritic chest pain, chest pain, shortness of breath, paradoxical breathing, decreased or absent breath sound, shortness of breath, chest pain. Beautiful, great job guys. So this image here is showing you guys a right-sided pneumothorax. So do you guys see the vascular markings like the hilar in the left lung, that normal side? Now compare that to the right-hand side. I don't, there's like hardly any vascular markings whatsoever. So I'm noting hyperlucency and absent vascular markings on the right. So I am very concerned for a pneumothorax on the right there. Hence not really any lung sounds, chest pain, dyspnea, those types of things. 
All right. We talked a lot about chest x-rays, guys. Let's switch gears a little bit and talk about abdominal x-rays. They're not quite as exciting as chest x-rays, but still something that we should at least touch base on. So question for you guys, what is an indication for an abdominal x-ray? What do you got for me? I'm not going to get an abdominal x-ray on every patient with abdominal pain, but there might be some scenarios where I will. Somebody might have to get an abdominal x-ray on me. I have some flatulence. Scary. <laughs> Don't worry. I, I, pu I push mute every time it happens. <laughs> that was supposed to be absent flatulence. I don't know how it didn't. Um... <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry. No, you're, you're good. I had to comment on it. I saw, I saw an opportunity there to make you guys smile. Insurance maybe, would probably deny that claim for that. Right. Can we add maybe foreign body to that? Yeah, I like that idea, foreign body. So any time that I am suspicious for a bowel obstruction, which a lot of those symptoms go along with a bowel obstruction, or perhaps like an impaction, fecal impaction, um, I have suspicion again for that acute intra-abdominal process where I might be looking for free air, like noted earlier, or perhaps what about a kidney stone? Maybe I want to get an abdominal x-ray because I don't have a CAT scan or an ultrasound at my fingertips to look for that. Uh, and like Brandy said, a foreign body is another great indication to get an abdominal x-ray. Nice job, guys. So the abdominal x-ray has a little bit more limited value in our diagnosis than when comparing it to the chest x-ray. And it's usually of most benefit in the acute abdomen and might help you guide further testing. So there's a little bit of identifiable anatomy in the abdominal x-ray. Unfortunately, it is missing many things as compared to say a CT scan. But some of the anatomy that we can identify are the liver, the gastric bubble, kidneys, the psoas muscle, and also the ascending colon, the sigmoid colon, and the rectal gas shadow. So overall, we can see some anatomy, but again, not much when compared to a, a CT scan. We know there's a lot more going on inside of that abdomen. So your interpretation, it's gonna be like any other x-ray interpretation. You're gonna to want to try and develop a consistent and systematic approach. So intraluminal gas can be normal as long as it's in the right place and in the right amount. So you'll look for gas all throughout the GI tract and try to find out if there's any obvious uh, dilation anywhere in the, in the bowel loops. And you might not be able to know what this looks like right out the gate, but I am going to show you guys some examples of some bowel obstructions. Okay. Extra luminal gas, however, is never going to be normal. So with a bowel obstruction, for example, the number of bowel loops gives an indication of the level at which the obstruction has occurred. And if we're noticing a small bowel obstruction on an abdominal x-ray, it's most often seen very central on that abdominal x-ray. And then the large bowel obstruction has different specific characteristics that I'll share with you guys very soon. So here's a clinical scenario. Here's an abdominal x-ray. So we've got a 34-year-old male vomiting at least 10 times prior to arrival has nine, if not 10 out of 10 diffuse abdominal pain. And last bowel movement was six days ago. This is an example of a small bowel obstruction. You'll see a lot of that dilated small bowel is more central on that x-ray. So I see quite a bit of dilated bowel loops. 
And I'm going to be suspicious of a small bowel obstruction. Given this image and my clinical judgment from the scenario that I just presented, I'm going to be sending this patient perhaps into the hospital if they're not already there for further evaluation and treatment. Here's another clinical scenario. So we have an 84 year old male, again, vomiting, but this guy has altered mental status. You go to examine the patient, they have a rigid abdomen, they're tachycardic, they're hypotensive. So this is an example of a large bowel obstruction. And you'll see that there are characteristics of large bowel here. So very dilated and it looks very continuous all throughout, almost like there's like a giant anaconda or something in the abdomen is sort of what it looks like for lack of better terms. So given the clinical scenario, my clinical judgment, this image, this patient likely has a large bowel obstruction. I think uh, clinically you would see that patient also has a lot of abdominal uh, distension. They're going to be having vomiting and nausea um, cramping abdominal pain too is some of the history that will present with that. I would agree. Tons of GI symptoms, pretty much any GI symptom you can think of, this patient's likely experiencing that. Another example for you guys of an x-ray. So this is a 70-year-old female. Last bowel movement was eight long days ago and feels pressure in her rectum. No laughing. So this is an example of fecal impaction. You can see a pretty large uh, burden of stool in the rectal vault there. And this patient is essentially FOS. So we're gonna need to prepare for manual digital disimpaction, maybe an enema or other measures to help this patient out with their acute constipation. So that extra luminal gas or that free air, like we talked about earlier, some causes, perforation, post-abdominal surgery, maybe they have gallstone ileus, abscess, complicated diverticulitis that's getting even more complicated, those types of things. So this image here, if we are thinking about free air, are you guys seeing it all on this image? And if so, where do you see it? You can type it in the chat if you like. Or maybe you look at this and say, it looks good to me. Nice. You guys are spot on. So I'm seeing bilaterally left upper quadrant, two arches in the upper abdomen. I would agree, there is bilateral free air here on both left and right hemidiaphragm. I wouldn't be surprised if this patient is, you know, they're gonna need surgical intervention immediately that you don't wanna miss any type of uh, free air on an abdominal x-ray. So I see it bilaterally here. Do you guys all see that there? Should I try to draw it out? Everyone's nodding their head. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Cool. All right. So thinking about renal calculi, also known as nephrolithiasis, also known as kidney stones. So these can often be identified on an abdominal x-ray, uh, what we call a KUB view or kidneys, ureter, bladder. Quick question before we talk more about this, what might make you think your patient is experiencing a kidney stone? Go ahead and type it out in the poll everywhere. Some of the common terminology I've heard men say is, it feels like I'm having a baby. How dare those men even think they have any idea what that feels like? 
I've, I've had a handful of women tell me it felt worse than childbirth, but so pain flank, those are the biggest words. Cause I think those were typed the most. So flank pain, um, Brandy, I'm curious if you have a patient who walks into your clinic, uh, and they have what you suspect is, uh, kidney stones, what do you see in your patient? Typically, I would get a UA on that patient, and you're going to see a little bit of um, blood in the urine. You're going to uh, see that they have CVA tenderness. Typically, it's going to be unilateral. Um, however, it could be bilateral if they have a stone on each side. Sometimes they're going to say, if I drink a little bit more water, it's not as bad. And I always equate that to the thought process of a rock, which a stone is 93% of the time it's a calcium stone. There are other stones, but most of the time it's calcium and you don't know what shape it's going to be. So with that being said, it could be scratching them up when their kidneys aren't full of water. So they will complain um, with hydrating themselves versus not. Um, and they will complain about it sometimes radiating to the flank because it's moving. It's a stone. It can move. Excellent. And I, I have also seen many patients come in where I suspect a kidney stone. And it's often a very dramatic presentation. I'm sure a lot of you have seen that or perhaps have experienced that before. Um, I have had a few patients in my clinical practice as well where I was expecting uh, perhaps an appendicitis because they had pretty severe right lower quadrant abdominal pain and it ended up being a kidney stone. Um, so again, often severe pain, often a very dramatic presentation. And like Brandy was saying, likely going to be at least some microscopic hematuria when you get that urine dipstick and patients going to need some pain control. So here are a couple examples of kidney stones on an abdominal x-ray. I don't know if you guys have ever seen these before, uh, but if we look at this image on your left, do you guys see a kidney stone anywhere on that image? It's subtle, but it's definitely there. Like maybe that left side, there's like a one. I don't know how to explain it. So I am going to see if I can draw a circle for you guys to focus in on. Whoops. Let's try that again. Draw. It's on the right hand side and it looks slightly uh, white just next to the spinous process. Do you guys see that little area? It's small, but it's definitely there. Look just to the right of that red circle. Do you see it? That's a kidney stone. And then if we look at the picture on the right, there is an even more obvious kidney stone. It's, uh, it's massive. Um, look just to the left of this red circle. Here is a kidney stone right here. Okay, so you can pick up kidney stones on a plain abdominal x-ray. I think it's important to remember um, the size of those stones. Don't just think because your, your patient presents with a stone that they'll automatically pass it. You have to remember the anatomy as it relates to the bilateral uterus um, that go into the, to the bladder. They're about three millimeters typically. So if that stone you know, is four, five, six, it's gonna hurt for them to pass. So they're gonna need some intervention there. For sure. All right, some other indications for an abdominal x-ray, maybe foreign body. So you're gonna wanna consider the location and the item that was uh, potentially swallowed. And think again, will this uh, foreign body be able to be seen like the coin that we saw earlier? Or is it gonna be that piece of chicken that grandma was choking on that probably won't be seen on an x-ray? And you always wanna think about what are the risks? 
So here is an example abdominal x-ray. And I think you probably, I've seen a lot of O faces from the students like, whoa, what is going on here? And that was my face too when I saw this x-ray. So this clinical scenario was a 14 year old male coming in with depression, history of suicidal ideation and was brought in by his parents and simply just stated, I have abdominal pain. And on exam, the patient was clearly uncomfortable. The abdomen was very tender, even on very light palpation. So unfortunately, this young gentleman was purposefully swallowing foreign objects in order to hurt himself. I can see what looks maybe like the end of a zipper, a paper clip, some other like metal um, foreign bodies, maybe like nail clippers. I, I don't know. I see all kinds of interesting metallic, likely metallic foreign bodies there. So this patient needed to be sent to the ER immediately because this was likely going to be a surgical case. All right. So. I have a lot of other example x-rays that I wanna show you guys. We have until 6 p.m. I'm wondering, do we take a five minute break or do we hustle through the rest of these slides? Hustle. Hustle. I gotta, I gotta hustle. Any, does anybody second that hustle? Hustle, hustle. <laughs> hustle, hustle. All right, we got lots of hustles. All right, let's hustle guys. Let's do what we do best at EMU. Let's hustle. All right. So this scenario is a 26-year-old female. She was hit in the face with a baseball just prior to arrival and initially had some epistaxis, but that has now resolved and is coming into you today complaining of nose pain. And on exam, the nose is tender. There's no obvious deviation. And the nares do have some dried blood upon inspection, but luckily the nares are patent bilaterally. And you order a nasal bones x-ray. Brandy, do you see anything going on here? I do. It looks like she has a small but notable fracture. I would have to agree. She On this lateral view of the nasal bones, there is a, a, a pretty obvious fracture of the nasal bone there. Great pickup. Here's another clinical scenario for you guys. So we have a 19 year old male was snowboarding and fell and injured his right shoulder. And on exam, he's guarding that right shoulder. He has generalized tenderness all about the right shoulder. And on exam, you notice there's some bruising of the right anterior clavicle area. There's decreased range of motion of the right shoulder, mostly due to pain, but luckily the remaining right upper extremity exam is within normal limits. Brandy, what do you see here? Looks like a clavicular fracture. I would have to agree. Mid shaft, right clavicle fracture. Most of these will just heal up fine on their own. Uh, you put them in a sling and you send them on their way. Uh, there are some that are so bad that there's like extreme tenting of the skin at the clavicle there, or perhaps a, a bone is protruding and it's an open fracture. Um, so you just wanna be mindful of those things. Another example for you guys, 24 year old male was playing basketball, balling it up, went for a slam dunk and hurt his left shoulder. And on exam, he's guarding the left shoulder. Luckily, you notice that the axillary nerve is intact. And you knew that because you scratched right over the bicep area and he could feel you scratching there. The remaining left upper extremity exam is within normal limits. Brandy, what are you seeing on this x-ray? That looks like, is that joint separation, Frank? Uh, I don't know if I see joint separation, but I'm, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that, uh, the humerus there, the proximal humerus. Does it look like it's, it's in the joint there or does it look like maybe it's out? Looks like it is out of there. There. Yeah. yeah. You, you guys see that? The ball of the humerus is anteriorly displaced. 
Mm -hmm. And this patient will need shoulder reduction in order to get that back in place. Incredibly painful. All right, another one for you guys. 15 year old male slipped on the ice this morning in cold, snowy Michigan and has right shoulder pain now. And on exam, there's an obvious deformity at the right proximal arm area. You are unable to palpate a radial pulse. The right hand is pale and the patient's endorsing paresthesia of that right hand. What do you guys think of that x-ray? Oh, obvious displaced fracture, probably um, arterial occlusion. Yep, so I, I'm seeing an obvious proximal humerus fracture and you are worried about complications of compartment syndrome because the patient is experiencing some of those, if not all of those five Ps of compartment syndrome. So you're sending this patient right into the hospital for immediate intervention. Great job. Here's another one. 14 year old female was playing around with friends outside and just mysteriously developed some right shoulder pain on exam. There's some mild decreased range of motion. The right shoulder has diffuse tenderness to palpation, mostly anteriorly, but the remaining right upper extremity exam is normal. Brandy, I believe you had the correct diagnosis here for a previous image. What are you seeing on this x-ray? That one has definitely got some joint separation, AC joint. I would agree wholeheartedly. I am seeing some pretty obvious AC joint separation noted there. Luckily, this is usually pretty easily treated with just a sling and following up. Here's another one for you guys. 33 year old male fell while skateboarding this time has right elbow pain. On exam, your patient is not able to fully extend that elbow not all the way, and has tenderness to palpation at the radial head. The remaining right upper extremity exam is normal. What do you guys think about these x-rays? Pretty subtle, but it's there. What are you seeing, Brandy? Looks like a, a subtle radial head fracture. I would have to agree 100%. So uh, on this image on the left, let me see if I can draw. There's a slight abnormality to the left of that red circle. Do you guys see this? It's very subtle. But if I come over to the image on the right, there is a a crack all the way through this radial head. There's a very thin black line. So I would definitely call this a radial head fracture. And I'm not surprised because clinically, the patient's hitting all the bells and whistles, especially that lack of extending the elbow all the way out. Great pickup. All right, I hope you guys can all see this one like right out the gate, like, whoa, what's going on with that arm? So 25 year old male was at a bachelor party was sleeping on the top bunk bed and was drunk and slid off the top bunk of the bed onto a concrete floor of the cabin. Guys coming in complaining of left forearm pain. And on exam, 10 out of 10 pain to the left arm. There's an obvious deformity in the left forearm. Uh, luckily though, for this guy, the remaining left, uh, left upper extremity exam is normal. I don't know about you guys, but I see fractures of both the radius and the ulna. And I'm going to be sending this guy in for reduction because they are quite displaced. Dr. Schaller? Yeah. When you talked about displaced, and I have a question. When you said sure. some of these can be just slinged and they will heal, mm -hmm. I guess, how do you determine like displaced versus non-displaced? When do you refer them to ortho? When do you like send the ER or yeah, sling is appropriate? That is a great question. So it's going to depend on the bone and any other clinical features. So for example, a clavicle, 
even if it's displaced, as long as there isn't like extreme tenting of the skin or there isn't an open fracture, those are usually treated with just a sling and follow up versus something in the arm, uh, like we see in this image here, um, or a shoulder, uh, it can't remain out of the socket that could lead to further uh, potentially compartment syndrome, other complications. So just having this like exposure, starting to look at what injuries, you know, could, could just have that sling and follow up, which ones require more immediate care. Uh, it really depends on the fracture site. I agree. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So I tried to compile a lot of different fractures for you guys so that we could at least begin the discussion so that you guys could see what this looks like on radiology. All right, we're on slide 94 of 106. We're coming down the home stretch, guys. So 66 year old female slipped and fell, is complaining of right wrist pain. And on exam, you're noticing there's tenderness to the anatomical snuff box and the right distal radius. There's mild edema noted there as well, but the remaining right upper extremity exam is normal. Are you guys seeing anything unusual with this x-ray on either view? Who can tell me where the snuff box is? Has anybody heard that term before? No. Here. Some people nodded yes. Some people are trying to show me visually and some people said no. So I am gonna try to show you on my wrist. So if I uh, extend my wrist out this way, there is a little crook in the wrist. It's on the radial side and there's a little indentation there. Feel it on yourself. If you take your wrist again, push it forward and feel, you might be able to see a groove there that is called the anatomical snuff box, okay? And if a patient has tenderness there with any type of wrist or hand injury, there could be an underlying fracture or pathology. So we call that the anatomical snuff box. So when I'm looking at these images, I am seeing there is a subtle fracture line here on the distal radius, which if you think about where that snuff box is, that's if I pressed right there, I'm sure it's gonna hurt the patient. If I look at the lateral view of the wrist, right on the side here, I'm noticing fracture as well. So again, that's through the distal radius. We call this a collis fracture, distal radius fracture. Little bit more with that snuff box. So another example, 44 year old male tripped while using the wheelbarrow this afternoon and had a foosh. Foosh stands for fall on outstretched hand. We use it a lot of time in our documentation. Complaints of left wrist pain when they come in. On exam, there again is some snuff box tenderness and otherwise exam is unremarkable. So if I'm noting snuff box tenderness and I'm thinking about the anatomy of that area, I know there's the distal radius, but there's also a bone in the hand within that anatomical snuff box. What bone is that, Brandy? Looks like that's gonna be uh, the proximal uh, aspect of a radius. So think of this bone right here. Where, yeah. That one's this, a, I need to see, Frank. I'm not sure if the, this can see it. That's all right. So this one here, it, uh, somebody said styloid. That's very close. It's not styloid. It's scaphoid. It's called mm -hmm. the scaphoid bone. Okay. So again, uh, so there is fracture through and through the scaphoid bone here. So it's not all about that radius and ulna when somebody has wrist pain or anatomical snuff box tenderness. It, you got to pay close attention to the scaphoid bone as well. So this patient has a scaphoid fracture. All 
All right. This one's kind of silly. I hope you guys are ready for this. I had so much fun making up the clinical scenario. So we have a 32-year-old male. His occupation is a professor. No idea who that might be. He got mad after receiving an email from the university president stating that he would have to teach virtually next semester. And subsequently, he punched a steel beam. He was so upset. He is so sick and tired of the pandemic. And now he comes in and he's having right hand pain. On exam, there is tenderness noted to the fourth and fifth metacarpals. There's some edema and bruising noted there as well, but the remaining right upper extremity exam is within normal limits. What are you guys seeing on this x-ray? Did he, he happen to punch, what was it there, Dr. Schaller? He punched a steel beam. <laughs> <laughs> so he's got, he's got pain and tenderness on the fourth and fifth metacarpals. So we're talking ring finger area, pinky finger area on the hand. Are you guys seeing an abnormality there? I got Dr. Loomis chiming in. She looks like she's got the diagnosis correct. That's a boxer fracture. So the fifth metacarpal right here is an abnormality. This is a fracture. And it's not surprising given this, uh, this young professor just got all mad and punched something and had that tenderness at the fourth and fifth metacarpal. Nice pickup. Another example, 59 year old female fell on the last step of the stairs while coming down, caught her finger on the railing and now has pain in her middle finger. On exam, has an obvious deformity of the right middle finger. How's that x-ray look to you guys? Bone avulsion. I didn't know how to spell it. Sorry. <laughs> like, I know what you're saying. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. And someone says displaced. So given the history, given the exam, checking out this x-ray, I don't know about you guys, but this area right here looks grossly abnormal to me. It looks like the finger is completely displaced. It's out of socket. So this, this patient has a displaced third metacarpal and will require a finger reduction after a digital block. You're gonna to wanna to numb that finger up before doing that. I've seen a lot of those. All right, 49 year old female fell onto her buttocks after slipping on the ice while taking the trash out to the curb this morning and comes into you complaining of tailbone pain. On exam, you're noticing very mild edema and tenderness to the tailbone area on palpation. You get an x-ray of the coccyx and there's a large rectangle there and it is zooming in and I am seeing fracture of the tailbone all through this area right here. Got this it. is all, all fracture. It that hurts. The vast majority of these heal up with no further intervention. You just got to help them out with pain control. Another one, 96 year old lady. Wow. 96 slid out of bed this morning and now has left hip pain on exam. There's extreme tenderness to the left hip when log rolling the affected extremity. The left lower extremity is also noted to be shorter than the right lower extremity and is slightly externally rotated. Remaining left lower extremity exam is normal. What are you guys suspicious of here? Nice. I'm seeing lots of correct answers come in. Hip fracture, left hip fracture, broken hip. I agree wholeheartedly. Uh, if I look at this proximal femur on the left here, 
this is grossly fractured, especially when comparing to the femoral neck on the right. Nice pickup and not surprised given that clinical scenario either. Another example, 18 year old female fell directly onto the knee on a concrete floor and is now coming in complaining of knee pain. On exam, the patella is very tender to palpation. There's edema, there's ecchymosis and the remaining lower extremity is unremarkable. You get an X-ray of your patient's knee. What do you see going on here? Looks like she fractured that patella. I would have to agree, 100%. Miriam says fractured patella, beautiful. I would agree. <clears throat> it's sliced in half. It looks like she has one patella in her thigh and one in her knee. Um, so not surprising given that hard direct impact onto the concrete and your exam as well. Nice pickup. 29 year old male was playing soccer, had the right leg twisted and is now complaining of right knee pain radiating all the way down the shin on exam. There's very mild edema to the right lower leg very mild tenderness noted to the lateral lower leg, otherwise unremarkable. You get an x-ray of the knee. How's that looking, guys? Looking at the patella, the femur, the tibia, the fibula. Anything sticking out to you guys? A proximal fibula fracture. Beautiful. Yes, thank you, Tina. I would agree, proximal fibula fracture. Thank you, Tina. Thank you, Julie. I see you too. Uh, looks like there is a, a proximal fibula fracture and this patient is going to need a, uh, a knee immobilizer and follow up with ortho. Another one, 19 year old girl was cheerleading and injured her ankle didn't really give a good explanation of what happened, just said was cheerleading and now my ankle hurts. Prior to uh, um, arrival, she iced it, she elevated it, she took 600 milligrams of the magical ibuprofen and it's coming in complaining of ankle pain. On exam, there's diffuse tenderness and edema about the ankle, otherwise unremarkable. What does this ankle x-ray look like to you guys? Are you seeing any abnormalities. How do the bones look? A Think distal about the history. Tibia fracture? That distal tibia looks questionable, doesn't it? Specifically the posterior malleolus. Do you guys see this fracture line right here? The whole posterior malleolus looks like it's hanging off. Okay. This might end up becoming surgical, um, but nonetheless, you would splint this patient, talk about pain control, talk about rice therapy, rest, ice, compression, elevation, and get them follow up with ortho. You don't necessarily have to rush them to the ER, but you do wanna think about this might become surgical. All right, we're getting so close guys. We're like down to the feet. Slide 103 of 106, 50 year old male foot was ran over by his wife in the driveway by a motor vehicle accident. It was an accident. It was a complete accident. He's having right foot pain and he comes into your clinic on exam, that right foot, there's ecchymosis, there's edema, there's tenderness to palpation noted to pretty much all of the metatarsals. The remaining right lower extremity exam is unremarkable. You get a foot x-ray because you are curious, what does that foot look like after getting ran over by a car? And this one is sort of tough to see, but there are several metatarsal fractures. Two, three, and four are all fractured. So let me see if I can point with my cursor. Fracture here, two, three, and four. It's subtle. I wish I could zoom in on it more to show you guys. Uh, but given the history of getting ran over by a car, foot ecchymosis, tenderness, we're not surprised here. Uh, this patient is going to need splinting and follow up with ortho at a minimum, right? All right, 
61 year old female was letting the dog out to use the bathroom, stubbed her pinky toe on the doorway and is now having right pinky toe pain. On exam, that pinky toe, there's some tenderness to palpation. So you get an x-ray to evaluate for fracture. Any abnormalities there that you guys can pick up? Looks like she has a pinky toe fracture. Not a tarp. I, I would agree. So looking at this bone here, there is a black line going through and through. More obvious on the medial side over here. You can see it protruding, sticking out a bit. So this is treated with buddy taping, rest ice compression elevation, over-the-counter analgesics. This patient will be just fine. And we've reached the end. I don't even want to know what happened to this patient. I really don't want to know. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for your time. It was a pleasure going through all of this with you. I hope you learned something. I hope you were able to smile a tiny bit. And uh, I will talk to all of you guys soon. Thank you so much for your time. And thank you again, Brandy. Thank you, Dr. Schaller. Thank you. Thank it was great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome, guys. My pleasure.